At long last, I shall partake of proud to be a hippogriff day. Some may call it unabashed self-aggrandizement day, but I call it Saturday. Make way, y'all, for I was being a hippogriff before it was cool. Hey now, party foul. I know I look like a griffin, but that's because I'm OG. <laughs> No, seriously, just look at my tush. <coughs> oh, hi, Queen Novo. So, what you in for? Moon into Queen 2? Yeah, I'm hardcore like that. So before diving into the show's presentation on hippogriffs and then griffins, let's first look back at where these mythical creatures got their start. One might think that given their inclusion in fantasy, architecture, and medieval heraldry, that the griffins, sorry, griffins, that lion eagle composite creature is a product of the same age, but not so. Griffins have been a part of our collective mythology for ages with examples ranging from Greece and Rome to Iran and the Egyptian Axks. The most concrete descriptions we have come from Herodotus, a Greek historian born in the Persian Empire. In his book, The Histories, because back then most of the good titles hadn't yet been taken, he described that, but in the north of Europe there's by far the most gold. In this matter again I cannot say with assurance how this gold is produced, but it is said that one-eyed men called the Aramaspians steal it from the Griffins. But I do not believe this, that there are one-eyed men who have the nature otherwise the same as other men. The most outlying lands, though, as they enclose and wholly surround all the rest of the world, are likely to have those things which we think are the finest and the rarest. And if the Aramaspi is triggering any sort of memory, then yes, you are correctly associating that creature that stole the idol of Boreas. The Aramaspi were a tribe of one-eyed men who lived in the foothills of the Rapian Mountains in northern Scythia. They were horsemen, which put them even further at odds with the Grips, later known as the Griffins. Griffins dug the gold out of the mountains using their sharp beaks. In fact, griffin is derived from the Greek word griphos, meaning hooked or curved, like their beaks. It's said that griffins created nests near gold mines and lined those nests with nuggets. Because of this, anyone who trespassed near a gold vein was quickly set upon and torn apart by their claws, talons, and beaks. But griffins also have a taste for horse meat, making them natural enemies and deepening their rivalry with the Aramaspians. It's important to note that Herodotus was one of the first people to study history and strive for more accuracy. That's why he voiced doubt about the Aramaspians being a truly cyclopean race. But he still thought that griffins were real. That's because misinformation well predates the internet, as does swindling. Hello there, my friends! I've journeyed from the Carpathian Mountains to deliver unto you the wonders of the griffin. Why, here you have a nest of bonafide certified griffin eggs. Aren't those ostrich eggs? Only to a blinded eye, which you appear to own a pair. Oh. But not to worry, these griffin feathers are said to cure blindness. Eagle feathers. Next up, we have a set of griffin talents taken live from the beast that tried to rend me in two. Those look a lot like antelope antlers. And you look like a person who wouldn't last one round with the beast that totally had these on his front legs. Now stop with your slander and behold this petrified, solidified set of griffin bones. Note the unique beak of this four-legged beast. We discovered these remains amidst the very gold mines that the Griffins protected. Okay, that's definitely a protoceratops. Now you're just making up words, you dunderhead. What are you even wearing? And as Griffins became more renowned, they wove into various cultures. Since the lion is king of the beasts and the eagle king of the air, the Griffin became the lord of all creatures, a symbol of strength and majesty. Which begs a question, why is it that so many mythical creatures are composite beings? Why combine a lion and an eagle? Or a snake, tiger, and ram? Why a bug and a bear? Here's the thing about humans. We are prone to predictive models. We like to categorize groups. If it flies, it's a bird. If it swims, it's a fish. We refine this later on, but the fundamentals develop quickly. Psychologist Mary Answorth argues that we solidify this ability when we're about six months old. But what happens when you encounter something that doesn't fit neatly into a category? We often call these things monsters, for they seem to defy any sense of natural balance and they stick in our memory. Add to that the fact that we quickly learn to avoid things with sharp claws or predatory traits. In fact, many fictional beasts help instill that self-preservation by serving as a kind of boogeyman. Jungian psychologists like Joseph Campbell emphasize that we populate the unknown with our own subconscious, including dreams of power and strength and fears of the same. 
A griffin became a vessel for both. For the Achaemenids of Asia, the griffin's constant vigilance and protective nature made it a guard against evil, witchcraft, and secret slander. For the Persians, the Homa was a guardian of light, and they erected statues in their palaces to honor this idea, a practice that is carried through to the modern era. Speaking of light, a griffin carried Apollo's chariot whenever the sun god had business on Earth. This same veneration carried forward to the Middle Ages, where the griffin became a symbol of strength and honor. The griffin, with a Y-P-H, specifically refers to the heraldry seen on a knight's shield. In his system on heraldry, Alexander Nisbet said, The griffin represents wisdom joined to fortitude, but wisdom should lead and fortitude follow. Though we mustn't forget that a griffin's power wasn't solely used for protection. They were predators, and they had to eat. This led to the old saying, to make griffins with horses. It's meant to express an impossible idea, similar to when pigs fly. But Ludovico Arasoto heard this saying and was apparently all like, Challenge accepted. And thus when composing his epic 16th century poem, Orlando Furioso, he granted his fabled knights a unique set of mounts. Say there, young knight. Is there a princess in a compromising position and in need of rescue from a horrific dragon? Want to rush to the rescue while avoiding becoming charbroiled? Good luck getting there with even the fastest horse. <laughs> Instead, how about you try the latest innovation in cross-species breeding, the Hippogriff? Fearing a magical conjuration that could short out on you at any moment? Heck no. The Hippogriff may be an impossible creature, but its production is 100% natural. No empty faction wrought by magic lore, but by natural was the steed the wizard pressed. I Hippogriff in wings and beak and crest. Formed like his sire, as in the feet before, but like the mare his dam in all the rest. To put it a less flowerly way, when a griffin chanced upon a mare in heat, rather than have her for dinner, the griffin decided to have a different relation. And thus we have a creature that is part eagle and part horse. This trusty creature is much easier to tame and train than the violent griffins, and can be as swift as lightning. Visit your local wizard today to begin the taming process in only a month. Say, that's some fine salesmanship you got going there, friend. That's because my product actually works. Relatively speaking, hippogriffs are a much younger invention than griffins. However, I just want to be clear that they are much older than Harry Potter. The thing about these mythical ideas is that there are new elements added every time. The whole bow before riding idea? As far as I know, that's unique to Harry Potter. Yet it blends well as hippogriffs were presented as steeds for knights, and chivalry would demand some form of respect. That same idea applied when 9th century author Stephen Scotus asserted that griffins made it for life, and should one partner die, the other would never bond with another. Don't know if this was true between the griffins and mayors that produced a hippogriff. Griffins became symbols within the Catholic Church, because repurposing images is often easier than trying to remove them. Some saw the griffins mating for life as an expression of the church's stance against remarrying, Yet others viewed this combination of Earth and Sky Dominion as a symbol for Christ himself, thus making the Chronicles of Narnia a bit awkward. And with that, I think we've covered plenty of the Griffins and Hippogriffs mythologies. So how about My Little Pony's use of these figures? Let's start with the Hippogriffs. Just as Hippogriffs in general are a more recent addition to our collective mythology, these bird horse beings haven't been a part of the show that long. What's more, while Griffin designs call attention to their hybrid qualities, the Hippogriffs of Mount Eris are designed to underplay this fusion. They feature streamlined coats that are as colorful as the ponies. They're certainly more approachable than the Griffins, but I will always regret one aspect. Early concept art for My Little Pony the movie featured a flight of Hippogriffs taking off to help rescue Twilight Sparkle and Lightly Equestria. For reasons I don't know, this idea shrank to just Skystar. It seems like a missed opportunity as the mythology for Hippogriffs makes them a perfect counter to the Storm King's army. What better force to send than creatures who are faster than lightning? Though speaking as a non-canon Hippogriff, I can assert that I am indeed faster than lightning... bliss. Especially after I've cheesed her off. I will destroy you! Just like now. Silver Quill, get back here so I can strangle you! I'll force feed you to tweak! I'll fry you up and serve you Kentucky Fried Style! Oh, but I will as my witness, I will strangle you like the chicken you are! Oh, you're so cute when you're angry, I just can't stand it. I believe you've not met my angry side yet. Her name is Thunderblight! I'll suck all the colors out from underneath you and steal your strongest traits, you miserable sack of pigeon feathers! Truth is that a lot of what we see of these hippogriffs is new lore. 
No mention of a Mount Eris in the various mythologies and the transformation to sea ponies or hippocampi is unique to Friendship is Magic as well. But there is one element that carries forward. The hippogriff became a symbol of love, as it was the offspring between two mortal enemies. Just by their place in the world, hippogriffs were an impossibility. With that in mind, let's look at any story where the hippogriffs play a key feature. Queen Novo couldn't be swayed by Princess Twilight's pleas, but by forming a bond with Skystar, they nearly persuaded the Queen to abandon her isolation. Terramar's struggle was to find a place in a world between the land and sea, and it was the bond with his family that gave him the freedom to embrace both. And Silverstream's impressionism reflects a lot of the positive emotions she associated with the Tree of Harmony. Plus, she seems the most eager of all the students to embrace the world around her. After so much time in isolation, she's thrilled at everything and greets it with an openness that one can't help but admire. She even managed to befriend a cockatrice, something that most people would consider impossible. That doesn't mean she's lacking in other emotions. If anything, that same love has made her very vulnerable. He's back and I'm never gonna see another sunset or fly through a cloud bank or study plumbing! But that love also gives her strength. But we learned that together we're stronger than you! In fact, I think that was the last time the Storm King was ever directly referenced. Silverstream slammed the book shut on his legacy. I think that the show, consciously or not, did link hippogriffs to the idea of family bonds and love. Which is another reason why I ship Silverstream and Gallus. The Griffin approach has been much more gradual over more seasons. Gilder was our first introduction for good and ill. Certainly, we got to see the power associated with Griffins. <laughs> But while the mythological griffin was seen as noble and virtuous, Gilda seems to suffer from a false pride. She looked down on others without having earned any place of honor. Contrast that with season 2's Gustave Lagrand, who may have been full of himself, but at least he had put in the effort to become a baker. To challenge your crude cake to a duel of delectable delicacies against my exceptionally oh! exquisite eclairs! Rainbow Falls and Equestria Games introduced recolors of the two griffin models hinting at a more diverse array, but these characters never had any speaking roles. Then came the big reveal, Griffinstone itself. An episode that, in my opinion, redefined the Griffins while tackling a subtle message. And what a reinvention we witnessed. All manner of Griffins combining different bird styles with varying feline forms. This was a much greater creative effort. There were also plenty of references to the Griffin love of gold. Always carry plenty of bits. The Griffins are sure to help you as long as you share the wealth. And yet this was no celebration of the Griffin Kingdom as it had fallen to wreck and ruin. Its citizens seemed driven by apathy rather than vigilance. They treated outsiders with disdain, but seemed to take no pride in their own identity. It's not every day that you can make Pinkie Pie break. No singing! No party store! No bakery! What is this place?! And all this misfortune is traced back to the loss of the idol of Boreas. Boreas, by the by, was the Greek god of winter and the northern winds. Fitting then that Griffinstone is located in the high mountains. The gold guarding griffins of legend live near the cave of Boreas. So between the Aramospi intruder and the idol's name, Griffinstone was the closest we got to both humans and deities in Equestria. Yet how strange that griffins, often used to symbolize positive values and even Christ-like qualities, were brought low by idolatry. I mean, it's in the title. The Idol of Boreas. Possessing the idol of Boreas filled the Griffins' hearts with pride. It's said that that one great treasure is responsible for turning Griffinstone into the most majestic kingdom of all the land. Couple of key notes with this. First off, it wasn't King Grover who made the idol. He discovered it. They never delve into its creator, but there is a reference to Boreas' northern wind. Legend says the idol of Boreas was made from the dust of golden sunsets, blown across the mountains by the north winds. Yet it's important to remember that an idol is not the same as a symbol. I've been talking about how griffins and hippogriffs came to symbolize positive ideas like vigilance, strength, nobility, and love. Yet despite the frequent appearance of these creatures in architecture, art, and storytelling, I never got the sense that people's attraction stopped with these creatures. No one worships at the altar of griffin feathers. A symbol is an attempt to exemplify an idea, something immaterial that is so much bigger than any representation. By contrast, an idol is a hard stop, an end in itself. It's putting all your sense of self-worth in the car you own, the clothes you wear, the status of your friends, or the attention you receive. 
It's not born from something internal, and thus it can always be taken away. That's what the idol of Boreas represents. It held us together. He gave us an identity. Their entire sense of self as a culture lay not within their achievements, their philosophies, or their individual talents. Instead, they were special because they had a rare item, until they didn't. King Guto was the last king of Griffinstone, and we all lived miserably ever after. The end! Except it wasn't. It was the start of a very difficult transition that required some help. For a long time, I wondered if Grandpa Gruff was really King Guto. He had the authority to speak for the military. And he occupies a very patriarchal spot. That's just his name. He's not any Griff's actual grandpa. But as I explored this idea within the fandom, several fans drew attention to a guard seen during the Aramaspi's escape, a guard who suffered terrible blows to his left side, across the eye. Such a guard could have observed the events just as closely as the king, and with perhaps some freedom of thought without the demands of a royal station distracting him. Whatever his history, I think Gruff has an agenda, and he's very good at covering it. An agenda that relies on Gallus, whom he volunteered to serve as a representative. Consider two conflicting messages we've received. Gallus doesn't need to know I'm proud of him, and he certainly doesn't need me trekking all the way to Ponyville. Grandpa Gruff asks for a lot of updates about how Gallus is doing. He expends a lot of energy keeping tabs on Gallus, but doesn't want Gallus to think he has Gruff's favor. And it's important to note that, unlike royal family members like Silverstream, Gallus has no ancestry to make him stand out. No relations to the crown, no achievements that set him apart. Poor kid was an outcast. It felt like I never had a place in Griffinstone. I think that Gruff realizes there's no going back to the way things were, so something new has to happen. Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash showed a hint of this when they convinced Gilda to start reaching out, building connections and recognizing one's own self-worth. Gallus' isolation makes him more open to outside ideas. If he has to work for and earn every step, then he can't lapse into the complacency the idol encouraged. One might rightfully ask, what about Gabby? After all, she was open to friendship and seemed much more enthused. Why isn't she Griffinstone's representative? To answer that, I'd like to consider an unfortunate term. Gabby is the exception that proves the norm. A positive and friendly Griffin in a culture described as... Rude, insensitive bullies. We never learn how she developed this perspective, and I get the sense that she was simply born different from other Griffins. While Gabby is a positive example of what might be, she's also suffering a disconnect from other Griffins and might not be able to serve as a bridge. A shame, as she is my favorite Griffin. Now, Gallus got off to a rough start. He was still driven by the empty pride we saw in Gilda. I thought you'd be... cooler. Who you call a nasty klutz? But we also learned that he's been hiding a lot of his best traits, likely to avoid feeling excluded. You paid attention in class! What? And through a lot of trial and error, plus moments of vulnerability, he grew from a nobody to a proponent. Singing together, even laughing together. That's what real heroes look like. Notice that holding a shiny bauble wasn't part of that speech. Because he's issuing a call to action. An idol is stagnant and demands complacency. It says, sit back and admire me. And believe me, I'm well aware of the dissonance of saying this on YouTube. This site is almost designed to turn people, pets, and other topics into idols. I'd argue that Gallus is the closest representation to classic Griffin myth. Even the swindler part. Grown from the tears of a basilisk, and tended day and night by pony magicians. Yet by the last phase we witness, he's become a royal guard. And while Equestrian Guard's discipline is somewhat lacking, he certainly seems more composed than his younger self. I imagine he'll be more dedicated, wanting to both prove his ability and understanding what it's like to lose what's important. Plus, Gallus may have been too young to drive the Chariot of the Sun Princess, but I could see him fulfilling that role with Twilight. I realize that I've gone on more about griffins than hippogriffs, but that's because there's a much longer history to this symbol. Yet both creatures feature more and more in our storytelling, and in doing so, they evolve. The ideals that griffins and hippogriffs represent will continue to find expression, because stories are more than distractions or escapism. There are means by which we convey ideas, whether it be bonds between family, the danger of idolatry, or the change that can take place over a lifetime. I don't know how griffins and hippogriffs will change as trends and ideas shape the future of storytelling, but I appreciate what's come before and look forward to what's in store. Now, if you'll pardon me, it's time those Mount Eris hippogriffs acknowledge me for the beautiful individual that I am. Who 
Okay. In hindsight, it probably wasn't a good idea to antagonize an alicorn to the point of dark transformation. Run, run, run as best you can! You can't escape me! I am Thunderblight! <laughs> but it's okay. I managed to rescue Grubber, who is the most important character in the franchise. Let him dream. Anywho, to close things out, I have a question for you all. Which species would you rather be? Give the video a thumbs up if you're Team Griffin. Give it a thumbs down if you're Team Hippogriff. Now I must go into hiding until the other not-me hippogriffs can sort things out. I'm Silver Quill. Thanks for watching.